Ingraham um, for today's Steenbach Lectureship. Uh, I want to start off by thanking all of the generous donors who contribute to the Steenbach Lectureship. Uh, without them, this lecture series would not be possible. So I invited Holly as my first Steenbach talk uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so because of some AV difficulties, I'm not loading my slides, I'll save them for her wonderful talk tomorrow. Um, but I just want to point out, um, Harry Steenbach was well known for a lot of his work, um, not just in vitamin A and vitamin D, but also in the ability to transition how an organism's environment impacts their physiology and also impacts disease manifestation. And I think this work particularly aligns with Holly's research, both her lectures today, which focus on, on phospholipids as a sensor for a hepatic lipid metabolism and gut brain access, um, and also for her work tomorrow, which will focus on nuclear uh, receptors and the regulation of, of um, osteoclast and osteoblast formation. Uh, and so beyond that though, I think what's wonderful about Harry Steenbach is he was really a visionary in the field. Um, and I mean, there's so many phenomenal researchers out there, but a researcher like Harry Steenbach, who had the vision to use his patent money to set up Wharf, who, I mean, truthfully, his vision inspired and helped build the careers of faculty like me through the Harry and Evelyn Steenbach Fund. And I think that's really one other reason why I invited Holly here. So besides her really phenomenal work in an animal physiology and regulation of disease, she's also been important in having a vision for changing science. And part of that has been done through her work with the UCSF Arachta program, uh, for which she was awarded the Martin Luther King Jr. Award um, through UCSF. Um, and it's really a testimonial to the fact that there are so many phenomenal researchers that Holly is really changing the demographic of science. And so please help me in welcoming Holly to Madison. This is her first time and we are baptizing her by ice. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. Uh, when I, a couple of things. Uh, when when I got the invitation and I looked who else had uh, given these lectures, I was telling my husband I better do a good job. <laughs> and um, I also uh, got off the plane uh, yesterday, and it was it was quite warm here. So my first time in Madison is uh, really been pleasant. Um, thank you. I've enjoyed all of the, the talks that, that uh, before our conversations has been great. I can see that you guys have an amazing um, metabolism effort here going and it's, uh, it's really enviable. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about work that really started uh, when I, I, I went to UCSF and I came out of Jeff Rosenfeld's lab of a lab of about 55 people and had to sort of pick up and decide what to do. And uh, I picked up the textbook of endocrinology and decided to work on a problem based on that. I don't know if I would suggest that for you younger people, but um, it's really what got me into the field of nuclear receptors, which I had vowed never to work on uh, in Jeff's lab because there were always these, uh, there was a lot of activity and a lot of uh, uh, competing men in that field and <laughs> so uh, but I, um, I I'm going to tell you about this work it's it's sort of the end of 20 or 25 years um, and I'm sort of moving in a new direction but I think we've really learned a lot about this class of nuclear receptors um, okay so the nuclear receptors that we have really focused on uh, are these NR5A and NR5A2 their their own little subfamily and um, they are somewhat unique in the terms of the nuclear receptor in that they have a very large hinge domain and they bind as monomers to a half site and they're always in the nucleus so um, one of the things about these receptors is that the pharma basically uh, chose to ignore these receptors because they were important in development. And they wanted to 
figure out how to drug other receptors, uh, many of the steroid receptors which you already know about. Uh, one of the things that we um, did with Gary Hammer back in 1999 as well as other people is showed that these receptors are modified by post-translational modifications in this large disordered hinge domain. And um, so we, uh, but before I go into that data, I'm just going to give you a, a glimpse of where these receptors are expressed uh, during development. And they're named also stereogenic factor one because Keith Parker cloned this and thought that it was important and it is important for stereogenesis. And li liver receptor homolog one, which is really not a great name, uh, David Moore coined that um, because it was initially found in the liver. Okay, so in development, you can see that NR5A1 or SF1 is expressed um, really highly in the adrenal gland, in the gonads and in the spleen, and then in the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So it really marks the whole endocrine system, which is why I was pleased to start working on this as it, uh, because of its role in regulating anti-malarian hormone. Um, and so it's very prominent in these tissues development and it persists in the adult. And then it, NR5A2 or uh, LRH1 is found in a lot of the epithelium of the intestine, the pancreas, and the liver, as well as some other places. So knocking this out is an embryonic lethal because it also regulates OCT4 and stem cells. This receptor is, does not, uh, is not embryonic lethal, but does lead to um, uh, changes in sex development, which is how I got into it. Okay, and, and as I said, one of the reasons that I started getting interested in this receptor is because of this sexually dimorphic expression with uh, its expression high in males and low in females. And in fact, this is really important because it's this differential in expression that helps regulate a key protein that's going to cause destruction of the female reproductive tract in males. So uh, we worked on that for... Um, several years uh, looking at the biology of that um, but then we got you know one of the things about a nuclear receptor is you want to know how it's regulated and so we sort of approached that two ways we looked tried to figure out okay what is its ligand what is binding in its binding pocket and what about these post translational modifications do they regulate receptor activity uh, this is just to show you um, the, if you make a reporter, a knock-in reporter for the SF1, you see it lighting up a testes, an adrenal, and the ventral medial hypothalamus, which is going to be a lot of my discussion for tomorrow. So I like to show this right around Halloween, or if you've gone to see that uh, play in New York, a Wicked, it's all about green. So I just, I love this, these green, uh, the green adrenal is great. Um, okay, and as, as I said, these receptors are heavily uh, uh, modified by uh, phosphorylation as well as sumylation. And in terms of a substrate for sumylation, which I'm not going to go into the detail, I hope that everyone sort of understands about sumylation. Sumylation is a, it's a protein that gets conjugated. It's a small protein that gets conjugated onto another protein and there's a, usually a cycle of it going on and off. And it, what's important is that um, it's this hinge domain that gets heavily sumulated. And if you uh, cre recreate this in in vitro assay by adding the, uh, really you only need one, the, the complex, uh, one complex to get this going, an ATP, um, as well as UCP9, uh, you get uh, this really nice simulated pattern and then that of course disappears if you add the protease in. And one thing that um, th these receptors are is in, in vivo and in cells you can easily see that they're simulated. So unlike other um, people that work on simulation, we really did not have to work very hard to show that these were fully simulated. And um, here you can just see that if you take the various uh, wild type, 
you can see that they're heavily sumulated. If you make mutations, you, you get rid of this sumulation in all of these cell lines, and importantly, in primary hepatocytes. So this, this, uh, these proteins are heavily sumulated. And now, um, we, we pursued this somewhat. I, I wanted to pursue this more, but the reagents for sumulation, um, you can easily do a loss of function. You can't do a gain of function like you can with phosphorylation. What we do know about the sumulation of these proteins is that once they get sumulated, you get gene repression. And if you get rid of sumulation, all of a sudden you see these uh, gene changes in these what we call sumosensitive targets and that's best illustrated here where um, we were the, f the first to actually go in and do a knock in of the sumo mutants in SF1 several years ago and uh, we you can see here we in in this mutant we've lost that sumulation in these embryonic or postnatal tissues here and the the upshot of that was that we would turn on these genes. Here's sonic hedgehog being turned on ectopically and inappropriately in a testes. And the, uh, the consequence of this is that we had an expansion of Leydig cells that produced steroids. So we had very, very high testosterone and very small testes. Um, and we also saw phenotypes in the adrenal. So this uh, was exciting in, in, at the time because it was really one of the first in vivo demonstration that this post-translational modification was doing something in vivo. Um, and so that's sort of where we've left that story. We, um, we wanted a way to figure out how you could regulate sumulation by pharmacology, and we did screens to look at for inhibitors of um, uh, NR5A sumulation and found one. But it's very difficult to get a substrate-specific uh, inhibitor, let alone a substrate-specific antibody to uh, sumulation. So this is, these are one of the challenges in the field of sumulation. Um, but so we we know that post-translational modifications are important for the regulation of these receptors, and we then uh, at the same time we're asking, okay, what regulates these receptors in terms of a ligand? And to do that, um, we so remember that these receptors were thought to be constitutively active; they're in the nucleus, and the question is, will they be regulated by any ligand? Um, and in order to do that, I sort of dove into crystallization and went back to my biochemistry roots um, from graduate school. And um, we then um, crystallized um, both the ligand binding domains of SF1 and LRH1 and discovered in, um, well, we initially did in 2003, we crystallized the ligand binding domain of the mouse LRH1, and there was nothing in the pocket. So I said, okay, great. These are receptors that don't need a ligand. Um, but then we crystallized the mouse and the human and the uh, human LRH1 and SF1. And what we found is uh, bacterial phospholipids right in that pocket with the lipid tails just uh, scooting up into that pocket with a really pretty large pocket for a nuclear receptor. Um, and so uh, we found phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylglycerol, phosphatidylethanolamine all stuck in the pockets. And then the question was really, are those lipids important? They could just be that you, they come along for the ride during the crystallization and they help stabilize the receptor. And at the time when we presented this work at the nuclear receptor meetings, we were met with lots of skepticism because this doesn't look like any of the steroids or some of the, 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 uh, the other ligands for nuclear receptors that had been identified. Um, and so we had to keep working on this to convince people that no, they really could be bound by, uh, a nuclear receptor could be bound by a phospholipid. And so, 
Um, and the other thing that's going to become important is that there were human mutations in SF1 that lead to gonadal uh, ovarian impairment and adrenal dysfunction in this disordered loop here that we could never see by structure and that will become important later on. So um, Ray Blind came to the lab as, a, as an, well not originally as an Aractive Fellow, become, became an Aractive Fellow and he's now an assistant professor at Vanderbilt and has really carried on much of this work. And what he, I said, we have this problem, we have a phospholipid in this pocket, what could be the ligand, the real ligand? And it didn't make sense to me that it would be something as boring as a bacterial phospholipid. So um, he set about and went through a series of phospholipids to look at the phospholinositols and found um, using a gel displacement assay, um, really a beautiful assay where you could see the difference in the mobility of the ligand binding domain. And you can see here that uh, PIP2 and PIP3 are the highest affinity ligand for this, uh, for both SF1 and LRH1, for the ligand binding domain. And um, so he, you know, one would think that if you could find the best drug that would go in and actually alter the activity of these receptors, it would be a PIP2 or a PIP3 mimetic, which we still don't have uh, today. So um, this is just showing you um, the, what, this is the ligand binding domain of LRH1, so this is, a, of course, alpha helical uh, bundle with this phospholipid, the lipid tails stuck up into that pocket, and then the PIP3, the head group sticking out in the mouth of the pocket. And um, we got beautiful electron density of that PIP3, so we know that it's in there very well ordered. And if you now take all of our combined structures as well as other structures done uh, by several other groups, including Eric Ortland's group, um, we can see that uh, this is the cloud of the ligand binding domain pocket here, this cavity, this large cavity, and here's the phospholipid tail sitting up there with the various phospholipids in the head groups. So um, we have basically a nuclear protein running around with a phospholipid in it with different uh, potential for maybe modification. Um, and what I will say is that um, in working with uh, Chris Kuchenbacher and, and um, Flederick's lab, uh, as well as other labs, we, we actually tried to figure out, okay, what happens if you have this lipid in the pocket? Does it change your ability to interact with co-activators? Because that, that was the standard uh, test that was done by pharma to find all of these synthetic ligands if you ever work with nuclear receptors. Most of them were all found by screening for recruitment of a co-activator peptide. And um, what you can see here is that even though we have a, an affinity difference in terms of peptide recruitment between PIP3, PIP2, and here is the APO with, with nothing in it, you can see that that's a very small differential. So in fact, the screening that was done by pharma to look for an, a, a ligand in terms of a co-activator recruitment assay really did not work so well. And this is, this is probably why, because we know this is a very high affinity ligand. So there, there's something fundamentally different between the, this receptor and other nuclear receptors in terms of that um, assay. Um, what we did find with uh, when we actually got the structure of PIP3 bound to SF1 is all of a sudden um, we saw that these, this loop 2-3 became ordered and that is it precisely where these human mutations are. So we really felt very good that having the right ligand in there orders that whole pocket and, and where you can now see that mouth of the pocket. So we have these lipids in there, we've got PIP2, PIP3, and one of the next questions was, okay, are there PIP2s and PIP3s in the nucleus? Does that even make sense? And um, 
work from maybe uh, two decades ago suggested that would be the case and Richard Anderson was who uh, I was talking to this morning was one of the first to suggest that the whole phospho inositide kinase and phosphatase cycle is go is present in the nucleus and active and I think this might even be from one of this nuclear phospholinositide cycle is there. This is showing that uh, the PIP kinase is present in the nucleus. Um, and we now know that, that almost all of the kinases and the phosphatases exist within the nucleus. Um, what we don't really know is how um, how those phospholipids get loaded into this nuclear protein. Um, and I would only suggest that there were two papers out uh, this last year suggesting that there can be lipid droplets that then come out into the nucleus and you have these luminal or nucleoplasmic lipid droplets that are there that can be modified by different enzymes. And um, this is actually just showing one of these droplets in a, in a real hepatocyte. So there were two different papers. So it could be, in fact, that the, that the way that these phospholipids, the original phospholipids, get loaded is through um, the, the protein coming up and grabbing a phospholipid and taking it out. Because we do know that if you give these proteins liposome with PIP2 and PIP3, they just go in and grab that right away. Um, but we also, um, Ray worked for several years to look, to ask whether, because we know there are kinases and phosphatases in the nucleus, could you actually go in and modify uh, a, the lipid when it is bound to a protein. Very similar, so if you think of these proteins, they're almost like, uh, there's like a plasma membrane where you're delivering the head group and it's able to be modified by different enzymes. And so uh, that's sort of what I've drawn here. Here's SF1 with a um, PIP, PIP2 here, and what uh, Ray found is that the IPMK, which we know is a nuclear kinase, it normally, of course, is um, uh, regulating inositol phosphate um, multikinase, so it's regulating these, these small inositol phosphates, but IPMK works very well at um, phosphorylating this PIP2 to basically create PIP3 once it's bound to SF1. And we, we showed, you know, it's, an, it's a correlation, but there's a changes in transcriptional gene targets when that occurs. And then he showed that P10 can then take this phosphate out to make a, a PIP2. So one of, the, one of the ideas that he's, oh, that he's really pursuing now is that I, and IPMK and SF1, as well as LRH1, form a very nice uh, uh, interact. They have very nice interaction. Um, and the question is, is whether there is changes to recruitment of of other proteins that are really using this head group to get information from. So is there a code with these lipids once they're bound into these transcription factors? So I, I, in talking to Richard, I mean, there's gonna be other proteins in the nucleus that are bound by lipids. Um, it, it, it's a really hard problem to, uh, to, to address because we, we would like to know, you know, how, how do these lipids then really affect transcription? Okay, so um, Ray is really pursuing that down at Vanderbilt, um, and I, um, new people come into the lab, and when new people come into the lab, they have ideas, and so I generally say, okay, let's, let's uh, pursue some of those. So in fact, Diego Miranda came into the lab, and his passion was the liver. Um, which I knew something about, but I mean, he really knew a lot about it. And you can see, wait, let's see, uh, let me go back. 
He is now at um, Gilead as one of the lead scientists in the NASH program. So um, he came in and said, I want to work in the liver. And I said, OK, LRH1 is in the liver. And I want to create some, um, some scaffolds where we could perhaps test compounds and, and understand a little bit better why uh, how these proteins are connected to phospholipid metabolism to sort of understand this connection. Um, and so he came to me with this, that basically from GWAS studies, this GWAS studies as well as several others, that LRH1 is repressed in um, patients with fatty liver or NASH. So um, this suggests that you need the full uh, dosage of LRH1 to be around to help offset the um, uh, NASH coming on. So um, that was great. I said, this, is, this will work great, but there's one problem. Um, and that is that um, basically when we did, the, as I said, when we did the original mouse structure, there was um, a salt bridge right here and no phospholipid in the pocket. And then in the human, what you can see is that basically this whole uh, region becomes ordered in part by the phosphate delivered from the phospholipid to really help stabilize that mouth of the pocket. So we have a problem. I, I want to know about this and I want to know about why phospholipids are important, but Diego wants to study this, so we have a problem. <laughs> so we have to overcome that problem. Um, and that was one of the first problems that we wanted to, uh, uh, to overcome, which is to humanize the mouse and figure out how we can study human LRH1 in the mouse. Um, and we also wanted to tag these NR5As because the antibodies really aren't great for uh, a lot of uh, different assays. And then um, one thing that I thought was really important was to be able to do a gain of function study. So everyone, you know, just we do the loss of function, no problem. But we can't go back and do a gain of function. And I thought this was really crucial because if people are saying, oh, phospholipid ligands, no way. Are ligands even important for these receptors? I wanted to test a mutant that we had developed from the structure that stabilizes the protein but precludes any phospholipid from coding in. So I wanted to be able to test those side by side with the wild type. So, um, and then of course, one of the ideas is could we create platforms uh, and identify new targets that would be activated by human LRH1. So um, we turned to this method and really Diego was the one who said maybe we should try this method. So Maury Birnbaum at University of Pennsylvania really pioneered this method um, where they're using um, basically you can deliver into a mouse um, an AAV8 TBG, which will get it into the hepatocyte, and then you can deliver various, uh, uh, you can deliver a protein or you can deliver a Cre recombinase. And the nice thing about this whole method is we could flag, we could tag our protein, and so we could go in and simultaneously deliver Cre to knock out the mouse and then re-express the human or re-express a variant. And I have this, this is perfect. Um, I really like this because we're going to use a lot less mice. We're going to spend a lot less money. And basically, once you do this, you have a stable expression that, that goes out. I mean, we've gone out to four months and we still have very stable expression using this method. So, and the TBG gets you to the hepatocyte. So this is just uh, the data um, you can see here. If you take, um, this is a GFP, if you put in GFP versus a Cree, 
you um, knock out uh, hum the mouse LRH1. And you can see these, anti this is a really good Western for LRH1 with these antibodies, so they're not really great antibodies. But then if you deliver Cree and human LRH1, you add back the flag tagged human, LH1 is seen here, and you've eliminated the mouse. So this, this really works well. Um, so the first thing we did is we actually compared it. How does taking something out in the adult work versus taking something out earlier? So a lot of people in the, in the, that work on liver use the albumin Cree. A lot of those people never think about development. I do. So actually, um, the albumin Cree comes on at embryonic day 14. And that's really early in development. And so I've, I always worry, what are we affecting in terms of what uh, compensation is, is occurring because you're taking it out early in development? And, and, I, I, and this is part why I wanted to do the AAV uh, TBG system, because I worried about uh, what would happen if you take it out so early in development. And in fact, so the original knockouts were done many years ago by Cleaver's group and, and David Moore's group, and they really reported very sort of um, un... The, 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 the phenotypes were really not very remarkable because they thought they would see a, a change in bile acids, but in fact, it was very modest. And in fact, so here's what it looks like. This is on a, a, even on a high-fat diet for six weeks. You really don't see much of anything. This is just a section of a liver. So um, if you now do the same thing where you take it out at six weeks of age and you treat these mice uh, or give them six weeks of high-fat diet, you can now start seeing this steatosis in these macro um, vesicular lipid droplets. So um, clearly taking it out acutely in the adult has an effect. And what um, we start to see is uh, fibrosis is shown here by the cirrus red and some of the other markers. So um, that, was, that was great. We, we're starting to see a phenotype when we, now maybe we can get somewhere in terms of how LRH1 is connected to phospholipids. Um, but probably the most uh, marked thing we see is that even after two weeks, if you take you do this manipulation, you knock out LRH1, and then isolate hepatocytes two weeks later, you see this marked increase in lipid droplets here. Okay, and this just shows you the distribution of lipid, these are very uh, large lipid droplets that accumulate. So um, we worked with, um, Mark Hellerstein and, um, uh, and others, as well as our mouse metabolic core, to figure out what might be the, um, uh, why are we getting these large lipid droplets? So we're, we're getting increased lipid storage here. We do get decreased fatty acid oxidation, so the getting rid of um, mobilizing these lipids is, is attenuated. Um, but when we looked at other changes like free fatty acid import into the liver, triglyceride export is not attenuated, and with Mark Hellerstein we did de novo lipogenesis and that is not different. So there's clearly a problem. We have increased storage, decreased fatty acid oxidation, and so of course we turned to trying to figure out what more might be going on and we did uh, profiling on these livers uh, both with high fat diet and with chow. Um, these data I'm just showing you are from chow because we wanted to sort of mitigate uh, all of the things that occur when a mouse is on high fat diet. And what came out of this um, what came out of this profiling were you get increased uh, genes that are going to be important for uh, lipid droplets, but we started seeing changes in genes uh, and elongase and desaturases that are important for polyunsaturated fatty acid synthesis. Um, and this, I think, I'll, this is just showing that that what we see on the microarray is real. So. Um, 
We decided to do lipidomics with um, uh, David Silver, who uh, Diego had done his uh, undergrad or his graduate work with in Martin Winkie at, at Duke Singapore. And we looked at these genes a little bit more carefully um, and showed that uh, the desaturase, the elongases, were all significantly down both on standard diet and high fat diet. So these, of course, are going to take dietary linoleic acid. And one of the important things they do is create these polyunsaturated fatty acid, uh, arachidonic acid. So, and, and I highlight that because when we did the lipidomic analysis, what we see in, in the, when, when we knock out LRH1 is we see a loss of all of these, um, it's, it's quite impaired, the, the amount of arachidonic acid derivatives. This is, I mean, I think I've talked to some of you who do lipidomics and I, I really have an appreciation for how complex this is after, after just trying to make sense of all the reams of data that we got from these guys from Singapore. Um, and this is just shows you, show you right here, you see this drop in the arachidonic acid phospholipid species. So um, this um, is, was cool because um, we, uh, at the same time, uh, Peter Tontnos and others had suggested that um, having the ability to have this diversity about uh, with phospholipids is important for fossil for uh, lipid storage. And so, what we would suggest is that without these. Um, diverse phospholipids, you, you've got decreased membrane fluidity and increased triglyceride accumulation. Um, and so that's sort of where we, um, what we think is going on with the LRH1 knockout. And we, it, it connects to phospholipid. We still don't know what the, what the key phospholipid ligand is, but at least now we have a function of LRH1 with phospholipid metabolism, which I was quite happy with. So without LRH1, we have a decrease in phospholipid diversity. We get liver damage and steatosis. And this just sh shows you um, that we can now rescue this with the human LRH1. In fact, it rescues even a little bit. Um, it, it, it does very well at rescuing. And really, quite nicely, the pocket mutant, which cannot take up a phospholipid, does not rescue. So we've got a, we've got a connection to phospholipid, and more importantly for me, we have a reason for why you would have this large pocket and why you would want to take up a lipid phospholipid as a ligand. Okay, so um, at the same time that we were finishing uh, doing this story, um, I was approached by uh, uh, Jim Baer, who is a pediatric GI doc, um, who treats kids with inflammatory bowel disease. And one of the things that he wanted to do was um, his goal really is to come up with new therapies for treating inflammatory bowel disease for kids rather than immune therapy because once you initiate immune therapy it's for life and he felt that rather than going to that immediately because he sees these very young kids with inflammatory bowel disease he really wants to think of new ways to treat inflammatory bowel disease that does not um, require that you uh, modify the immune system forever. So um, he had uh, worked with Ophir Klein on and learned um, and really was well, very well versed in organoids and um, these intestinal organoids that, as, as somebody said today, they're not quite differentiated, but they're really quite good. And, and uh, they're, they're much easier than hepatocytes because you can culture them and you can culture them for a year or more. And I could even culture them. I took care of them on Christmas for him. And so uh, <laughs> this, I didn't kill them and I didn't contaminate them. So I thought these were really cool little things. And Hans Cleaver, I know, has given the talk here. And th this is really an amazing contribution, I think, for the field. Um, so uh, uh, Jim was, uh, 
we can take mouse organoids and we can create human organoids. So he can go in and take out punctures and create human organoids from his patients, from healthy and diseased patients. So um, one of the ideas that w he wanted to look at LRH1 and using a villain Cree that's inducible by tamoxifen, he can then create these organoids that completely lack LRH1. So you can do this in a mouse, but you can also do this in an organoid, which is quite nice. Um, and the other thing is, is that we could genetically um, manipulate these organoids to create an organoid where we could knock out the mouse and then replace it with the human, uh, with this human flex allele. So that's, that's also very nice. And then um, we can take human organoids and what he showed is that you can use an AAV trick to infect um, with, um, you can do this in mice, in, in the mouse organoid or the human organoids, you can then infect that um, organoid with an AAV system to express. Now, with organoids, of course, you have a limited lifespan. It's not like hepatocytes. So every seven days, things are gonna go into the lumen. They, they, they change over. So it's, it's your window of time is much more narrow than it is with the liver and a hepatocyte. Um, nonetheless, the first thing I asked him to do was to go back and sort of do some work um, showing that uh, LRH1 was in the organoid because uh, uh, Johan Arwitz group um, had shown early on that maybe it was limited to Crips. And they had suggested that LRH1 would be important for the gut as well. But uh, what we found actually is that um, LRH1 is actually throughout the entire organoid. It's, it's a little bit more enriched in the crypt. So um, using the, the, the villain Cree and um, uh, the precursor of tamoxifen, uh, the prodrug, you can um, now completely eliminate LRH1 in these organoids as shown here. And when he did that and he treated the organoids with an inflammatory insult like TNF-alpha, you can see this is a wild type organoid. This is where we knocked out LRH1 and you now see this crypt cell death very prominently. So LRH1 is a very important for maintaining the integrity of uh, uh, these organoids and especially for that crypt region. Um, he also showed quite nicely that when you knock out LRH1 you lose the barrier function. So this is a pseudo lumen of these organoids. Remember it's inside out for those of you who don't know. Uh, but you can do a vital dye and show that um, without LRH1 that whole barrier falls apart as seen here. Um, and so now what we wanted to do was do what we had done in the liver, which is to replace it with uh, human LRH1. And so that's just shown here where um, he's replaced it with human. Uh, using this uh, flexed allele, we can also do this with a, a viral delivery. And what you see here is here's a wild type We've knocked it out. You see this cell death. This is in a mouse intestine, so this is not in an organoid. And then if you give back uh, human LRH1, not even at very high doses, you completely protect against uh, cell death. Um, and this is just showing in organoids, um, what I'm going to show you is that uh, giving human LRH1 is very protective against cell death but the pocket mutant isn't. So once again, it means that that lipid ligand is important for activity. Something that I think for, for me, after studying these receptors for as long as I have, just knowing that was, was really great. Um, so we got together with Alex Wang and David Moore who were doing experiments um, in, in mouse using this T-cell transfer model. So this is a model where you, you're going in and you're basically inducing colitis. So um, 
for, for those of you who know or don't know, a lot of people in the field use a chemical induced colitis model. It's really not the greatest. This, this is actually a much better model for inflammatory bowel disease or colitis because it's, it's not chemical. Um, and what you see here is that um, this is the, the normal mouse um, without, it, and it's, it's not perfect, but it, it survives all right. <laughs> if we start knocking, if LRH1 is knocked out, you really have disease that, that goes up. And then this can be restored if you give just even a small amount of LRH1, human LRH1 can restore, um, improve disease indices and restore survival as shown here. Should show, yeah, this is just the weight curves and you can see restoring with the human is here. This um, is without LRH1 and here's um, the um, Flox Fox allele. So uh, this is great. The human works perfectly fine in the mouse and in fact it works a little bit better. Um, and so what Jim did is he captured some diseased and healthy organoids from pa his patients and um, we asked, okay, in a human organoid, um, human intestinal organoid, they're a little bit more complex to um, culture because you, ha you can put them in differentiation media or not. Uh, but we were really pleased to see that LRH1 is throughout this hole in the epithelium of these human organoids. And he then um, insulted these with uh, TNF-alpha and asked, okay, what happens when you give LRH1? And you can see both in a healthy and a Crohn's disease setting, you can improve viability. So um, clearly, human LRH1 is, is great to have on board, or you want your full dosage of LRH1 around in the ear intestine. Um, so what we basically have shown here is that you, you improve resiliency when you have human LRH1 on board uh, or you overexpress it slightly. We don't know about agonists. We have tried all the available agonists. Um, we just really don't have a great agonist yet to work in vivo, unfortunately. Work, they'll work in cells but not in vivo. Uh, but what we have found are some unique uh, human targets of LRH1, CTRB, um, which it, now we think if for going forward for a pharma that wants to develop drugs, we've got some great targets for them to look at because I think before people were really using mouse targets and these are definitely uh, specific to the human protein. Okay, um, and then the, the other thing that we um, that we um, started looking at is what do the cell types look like in these um, organoids or mice that we have taken LRH1 out of. And um, not to get overly complicated, if, if Hans Cleaver here, this, he would have single cell data and a gazillion clusters of all the different cell types within the intestine. Uh, I'm making this very simple and showing you um, an intestinal stem cell with an absorptive cell, an EEC cell, which are, these are these peptide releasing cells as well as enterochromaffin cells and goblet and panis cells. And there's this, you know, very stereotypic differentiation pattern that occurs in both the gut and in organoids. So um, what we, Jim, found is that notch signaling goes down when we get remove LRH1, um, and goblet and panis cells go up, which is what we might have expected. And this is just the data showing an increase in these uh, goblet cells here. But um, unlike some of the earlier work that's been done on Notch, we had a bit of a surprise in that um, the EEC cell types go down. So this is just, and you, you would have, Jim is really patient. I don't think I would have had the patience to do this. So this is, you can imagine, this is an enterochromaffin cell. So this is about one out of a hundred cells in the gut epithelium and actually in organoids as well. Um, and so I don't know if you can see them. There's just these red 
cells scattered throughout here and he went through and counted in all the different parts of the um, intestine and what you see is a, a really pretty marked reduction in this cell type um, in when we get rid of LRH1 and that's just quantified here so this is the normal levels of introchromaffin cells and the, the drop when we get rid of LRH1 and we see a drop in these other immature EEC cells. So um, this losing LRH1 not only affects causes cell death, it causes a breach in the barrier, but it also reapportions the, the cell types within the gut epithelium. And um, we were excited to see this drop in EC cells because at the same time that we were looking at that um, in a project, uh, full disclosure that I was, um, that, that actually was doing with my husband's lab, David Julius, um, we, we started looking at these EC cells a little bit more specifically and it was really uh, Jim and Nick who got together and used the organoids and used the intestine to look at these specialized uh, gut epithelium cells and, and look at their um, sensitivity. So these are these are the cell t cells that are going to make 90% of your serotonin in your body. Um, and remember, I just showed you pictures of how few there are in the gut. So one out of a hundred is about all you need and you're producing 90% of your serotonin. Um, and they're really important because they, they, as we showed in the cell paper, they are really pivotal for that um, gut nerve interaction. And that was one of the questions that they set out to ask is, are these really um, receiving signals and then sending out signals to, to nerves? And Nick, who's a, just a supreme electrophysiologist, worked out this whole system, worked out what the receptors are to irritants like uh, to trip A1 and bacterial metabolites um, to then cause signaling to then cause release of norepinephrine or serotonin onto nerves. And it's that signaling that we think is really important and why you develop sort of a gut ache. Um, and what um, Jim really nicely showed is that these EC cells, which we've lost a lot of when we get rid of LRH1, are nestled right up against those nerves and, and form these synaps synaptic-like connections. And the real, um, the, you know, the, the electrophysiology is nice, but I like to go back to um, whole animal physiology. And with Stu Brierley, um, we learned how to do the visceral motor reflex response. Um, so I know this is, I never thought I'd be showing a slide like this, starting out from structure, crystal structures to this. But um, th this is actually, you, you put a little balloon um, up, up the anus of a mouse and um, then you start stretching it and they actually do this in in for patients because for um, children that have problems with um, controlling their defecation or pooping, um, they go in actually and do this assay to make sure that the reflexes are in place. This is a this is an innate reflex, and so you're basically going in and distending the balloon and then looking at the reflex with electrodes um, to, to see how much the, the mouse is responding. Um, and this, to give you an idea, just as a control, if you take one of these bacterial metabolites, which is isovalerate, um, and you look at this response, you can see here that in fact um, here's isovalerate really activates this response here and this is the um, this is in a wild type mice um, and so uh, here we have our LRH1 knockout and you can see the profound effect of losing 60% of those EC cells has a really profound effect on this reflex. So um, we, we really think that um, 
you know, the, the bottom line here is that we, um, I think of all the places that I would be thinking about for drugging the NR5As, um, it would be in this context, which is for inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel disease, which is to try to increase LRH1 dosage or activity in the epithelium. Um, and I don't think that by doing so you're going to have an effect on proliferation. There's controversy about that. But I, we have ne seen nothing that suggests that overactivating this receptor is going to cause proliferation or cancer. So um, we think that LRH1 is incredibly important for preserving the, the epithelial health. And in a way, if you think about inflammatory bowel disease, one of the things, it's an immune disease, but it happens because there's a breach in the epithelial layer. So um, perhaps drugs to LRH1 would help offset any um, inflammatory insult. Um, so we, of course, would love to know what the real lipid is in, you know, what is the real true lipid ligand in these different tissues. Um, I don't think we, we really know that and can a high affinity efficacious drug be identified for, for these receptors. Um, and then just in two minutes, I'm going to tell you what we're, what we're moving into um, and we've just gotten funded for, uh, which is my favorite thing, thinking about sex differences. You're, if you come to my talk tomorrow, you're going to hear a lot about that. But uh, women suffer far more, about three to four times more, with IBS than men do. And so um, one of the things that we've now gone in and done is use this, um, this VMR to ask what happens if you lose all of your estrogen versus giving estrogen back. And you can see that estrogen is really important for this reflex. We don't know where estrogen is. I mean, this is stuff that we're all uh, starting to tackle. Um, and we're going to tackle it in a, in a way that we've done with other tissues, which is just use some of these tricks. So um, I've meandered from uh, from structure, well, development, structure, physiology, probably sticking to physiology, although I love bio. Tomorrow you'll hear uh, my talk where we're going to have to go back to biochemistry. So um, as a scientist, I, and I think it's, you get to do exactly what you want to do. And so as you're just limited by what questions you ask. So uh, I just, I, I love all of these different techniques that I've used throughout my career. Um, so I need to thank the people. Um, Jim, Diego, Myra, and Andreas have really worked on the current projects. Ray, Blind, and Miyuki Suzawa were just instrumental for some of that early work that we did on phospholipids. Um, we have a, a lots and lots of uh, collaborators uh, at UCSF and Baylor, um, as well as um, abroad and at UC Berkeley that have all really helped contribute to making these stories the best they can be. And I cross this, I always show this because I cross this bridge to get to work and I, it's always the bridges in science that really make it fun and enjoyable and en enlightening in my opinion. And if anybody is interested, um, this is the first time I've ever worked with my husband. We, ju we just got a, a U01 grant to study the gut nerve system and visceral pain and sex differences. So I'm looking for postdocs, so if anybody is interested in, the, in this project, please email me or find me. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, we will open it to the floor for questions. And while we're waiting, I will ask one. Um, so you've done such a phenomenal job of characterizing these nuclear receptors in the different tissues they're expressed with their various functions. I'm curious, um, you observed uh, NR5, NR5A2 in the pancreas. I'm curious yes. what it's functionally doing there. So, I mean, people have looked at that, and I think what has, um, what, uh, Matthias Hebrock has actually looked at that, and they did a, a loss of function. And um, I think they were originally 
uh, thinking that they would see um, cancer, but they don't. Basically, they see a, a lack of differentiation of other cell types. So it, it had, I don't know that they followed that up so closely. Um, and I don't know if other people are doing it, but I know that it probably has a, a very important function in the pancreas. Yeah, and potentially maybe they're not using the right models if it's knockout in early differentiation in the hepatocytes. Yes. So that, that's probably part of the problem too in terms of the phenotype. Other questions? Oh. So I think there's evidence that hepatocyte nuclear factor 4-alpha binds to fatty acid. And I'm wondering how big a family do you think there are of nuclear receptors that bind to, to lipids or lipid precursors? And how diverse yes. is that family um, and well, other interactions? Well, I know interactions? That, um, that PPAR, one of, PPAR delta, I think, or PPAR alpha, has been suggested to bind to phosphatidylcholine. Um, and I think... Uh, I don't know if they had the structure, but they had pretty compelling data to suggest that was the case. Um, but it hasn't really been, it hasn't been followed up. It, they haven't done as much work as we have to, to prove that. Um, but it, they had fairly compelling evidence. And I, so yes, could other receptors be bound by phospholipids? Probably. Could other nuclear proteins be bound by phospholipids? Definitely. mentioned that uh, you think the fatty liver is caused by increased uh, fatty acid oxidation. And you, so does LRH1 regulate uh, fatty oxidation? Gene? It doesn't really. So that's, uh, that's why we were a bit confused because it doesn't directly at regulate those genes. It seems to regulate, uh, well, it, it regulates these genes that are involved in uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid synthesis, not so much fatty acid oxidation. It, it regulates these other genes that have been implicated in lipid biosynthesis, but haven't really been worked on. So uh, a few, but not the standard ones. What about CPT1? Uh, oh, I'd have to look. I'd have to look. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, so a lot of your uh, phenotypes in liver knockout were interrelated. Do you notice if there's any differences in liver metabolites in the intestine knockout? Uh, that's a great question. So we have not looked, and I think that would be something I think that Jim is going to be following up to look at that because you, you know, because the liver and the epithelium share so much. Um, I think it would be great to look at that. We just haven't done it yet. All right, I'm sensing an impatience for wine, which is oh, okay. just outside. So let's give Holly one more thanks. Um, thank you for a phenomenal talk.